The Noble Search Translated by Bhikkhu Sujato So I have heard. At one time the Buddha was staying near Sarvati in Jeta's Grove, an Arthur Pindika's monastery. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning and, taking his bowl and robe, entered Sarvati for alms. Then several mendicants went up to Venerable Ananda and said to him, Reverend, it's been a long time since we've heard a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. It would be good if we got to hear a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. Well then, reverends, go to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Hopefully you'll get to hear a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. Yes, reverend, they replied. Then after the meal, on his return from arms round, the Buddha addressed Ananda. Come, Ananda, let's go to the eastern monastery, the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother for the day's meditation. Yes, sir, Ananda replied. So the Buddha went with Ananda to the eastern monastery. In the late afternoon, the Buddha came out of retreat and addressed Ananda. Come, Ananda, let's go to the eastern gate to bathe. Yes, sir, Ananda replied. So the Buddha went with Ananda to the eastern gate to bathe. When he had bathed and emerged from the water, he stood in one robe, drying himself. Then Ananda said to the Buddha, Sir, the hermitage of the Brahmin Ramaka is nearby. It's so delightful, so lovely. Please visit it out of compassion. The Buddha consented in silence and went to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Now at that time several mendicants were sitting together in the hermitage talking about the teaching. The Buddha stood outside the door waiting for the talk to end. When he knew the talk had ended, he cleared his throat and knocked with the latch. The mendicants opened the door for the Buddha, and he entered the hermitage, where he sat on the seat spread out and addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, what were you sitting talking about just now? What conversation was unfinished? Sir, our unfinished discussion on the teaching was about the Buddha himself when the Buddha arrived. Good mendicants, it's appropriate for people from good families like you, who have gone forth in faith from the lay life to homelessness, to sit together and talk about the teaching. When you're sitting together, you should do one of two things. Discuss the teachings or keep noble silence. Mendicants, there are these two searches, the noble search and the ignoble search. And what is the ignoble search? It's when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn seeks what is also liable to be reborn. Themselves liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted. They seek what is also liable to these things. And what should be described as liable to be reborn? Partners and children, male and female bondservants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, and elephants and cattle are liable to be reborn. These attachments are liable to be reborn. Someone who is tied, stupefied, and attached to such things, themselves liable to being reborn, seeks what is also liable to be reborn. And what should be described as liable to grow old? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, and elephants and cattle are liable to grow old. These attachments are liable to grow old. Someone who is tied, stupefied and attached to such things, themselves liable to grow old, seeks what is also liable to grow old. And what should be described as liable to fall sick? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, 
chickens and pigs, and elephants and cattle are liable to fall sick. These attachments are liable to fall sick. Someone who is tied, stupefied and attached to such things, themselves liable to falling sick, seeks what is also liable to fall sick. And what should be described as liable to die? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, and elephants and cattle are liable to die. These attachments are liable to die. Someone who is tied, stupefied and attached to such things, themselves liable to die, seeks what is also liable to die. And what should be described as liable to sorrow? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, and elephants and cattle are liable to sorrow. These attachments are liable to sorrow. Someone who is tied, stupefied and attached to such things, themselves liable to sorrow, seeks what is also liable to sorrow. And what should be described as liable to corruption? Partners and children, male and female bond servants, goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, elephants and cattle and gold and money are liable to corruption. These attachments are liable to corruption. Someone who is tied, stupefied and attached to such things, themselves liable to corruption, seeks what is also liable to corruption. This is the ignoble search. And what is the noble search? It's when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn, seeks the unborn supreme sanctuary, extinguishment. Themselves liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted, understanding the drawbacks in these things, they seek the unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted supreme sanctuary, extinguishment. This is the noble search. Mendicants, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what is also liable to be reborn. Myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow and become corrupted, I sought what is also liable to these things. Then it occurred to me, why do I, being liable to be reborn, grow old, fall sick, sorrow, die, and become corrupted, seek things that have the same nature. Why don't I seek the unborn, unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted supreme sanctuary, extinguishment? Some time later, while still black-haired, blessed with youth, in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, dressed in ochre robes, and went forth from the lay life to homelessness. Once I had gone forth, I set out to discover what is skilful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. I approached Alara Kalama and said to him, Reverend Kalama, I wish to live the spiritual life in this teaching and training. Alara Kalama replied, Stay, Venerable. This teaching is such that a sensible person can soon realize their own tradition with their own insight and live having achieved it. I quickly memorized that teaching. So far as lip recital and oral recitation were concerned, I spoke with knowledge and the authority of the elders. I claimed to know and see, and so did others. Then it occurred to me, it is not solely by mere faith that Alara Kalama declares, I realize this teaching with my own insight and live having achieved it. Surely he meditates knowing and seeing this teaching. So I approached Alara Kalama and said to him, Reverend Kalama, to what extent do you say you've realized this teaching with your own insight? When I said this, he declared the dimension of nothingness. 
Then it occurred to me, it's not just Dalara Kalama who has faith, energy, mindfulness, immersion and wisdom. I too have these things. Why don't I make an effort to realize the same teaching that Alara Kalama says he has realized with his own insight? I quickly realized that teaching with my own insight and lived having achieved it. So I approached Alara Kalama and said to him, Reverend Kalama, have you realized this teaching with your own insight up to this point and declare it having achieved it? I have, Reverend. I too, Reverend, have realized this teaching with my own insight up to this point and live having achieved it. We are fortunate, Reverend, so very fortunate to see a venerable such as yourself as one of our spiritual companions. So the teaching that I've realized with my own insight and declare having achieved it, you've realized with your own insight and live having achieved it. The teaching that you've realized with your own insight and live having achieved it, I've realized with my own insight and declare having achieved it. So the teaching that I know, you know, and the teaching that you know, I know. I am like you and you are like me. Come now, Reverend, we should both lead this community together. And that is how my teacher, Alara Kalama, placed me, his student, on the same position as him, and honoured me with lofty praise. Then it occurred to me, this teaching doesn't lead to disillusionment, fading away, cessation, peace, insight, awakening and extinguishment. It only leads as far as rebirth in the dimension of nothingness. Realising that this teaching was inadequate, I got disillusioned and left. I set out to discover what is skilful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. I approached Udaka, son of Rama, and said to him, Reverend, I wish to live the spiritual life in this teaching and training. Udaka replied, Stay, Venerable. This teaching is such that a sensible person can soon realize their own tradition with their own insight and live having achieved it. I quickly memorized that teaching. So far as lip recital and oral recitation were concerned, I spoke with knowledge and the authority of the elders. I claimed to know and see, and so did others. Then it occurred to me, it is not solely by mere faith that Rama declared, I realize this teaching with my own insight and live having achieved it. Surely he meditated knowing and seeing this teaching. So I approached Udaka, Rama's son, and said to him, Reverend, to what extent did Rama say he'd realized this teaching with his own insight? When I said this, Udaka, Rama's son, declared the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Then it occurred to me, it's not just Rama who had faith, energy, mindfulness, immersion and wisdom. I too have these things. Why don't I make an effort to realize the same teaching that Rama said he had realized with his own insight? I quickly realized that teaching with my own insight and lived having achieved it. So I approached Udaka, Rama's son, and said to him, Reverend, had Rama realized this teaching with his own insight up to this point, and declared it having achieved it? He had, Reverend. I too have realized this teaching with my own insight up to this point, and live having achieved it. We are fortunate, Reverend, so very fortunate to see a venerable such as yourself as one of our spiritual companions. So the teaching that Rama had realized with his own insight and declared having achieved it, you've realized with your own insight and live having achieved it. The teaching that you've realized with your own insight and live having achieved it, Rama had realized with his own insight and declared having achieved it. So the teaching that Rama directly knew, you know, and the teaching you know, 
Rama directly knew. Rama was like you, and you are like Rama. Come now, Reverend, you should lead this community. And that is how my spiritual companion, Udaka, son of Rama, placed me in the position of a teacher, and honoured me with lofty praise. Then it occurred to me, this teaching doesn't lead to disillusionment, fading away, cessation, peace, insight, awakening and extinguishment. It only leads as far as rebirth in the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. Realising that this teaching was inadequate, I got disillusioned and left. I set out to discover what is skilful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. Travelling stage by stage in the Magadan lands, I arrived at Senanigama near Uruvela. There I saw a delightful park, a lovely grove with a flowing river that was clean and charming with smooth banks, and nearby was a village to go for arms. Then it occurred to me, this park is truly delightful, a lovely grove with a flowing river that's clean and charming with smooth banks, and nearby there's a village to go for arms. This is good enough for a respectable person who wishes to put forth effort in meditation. So I sat down right there thinking, this is good enough for meditation. And so, being myself liable to be reborn, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn, I sought the unborn supreme sanctuary, extinguishment, and I found it. Being myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow and become corrupted. Understanding the drawbacks in these things, I sought the unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted supreme sanctuary, extinguishment, and I found it. Knowledge and vision arose in me. My freedom is unshakable. This is my last rebirth. Now there are no more future lives. Then it occurred to me, this principle I have discovered is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, sublime, beyond the scope of reason, subtle, comprehensible to the astute. But people like attachment, they love it and enjoy it. It's hard for them to see this thing, that is, specific conditionality, dependent origination, it's also hard for them to see this thing that is the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, fading away, cessation, extinguishment. And if I were to teach the Dhamma, others might not understand me, which would be wearying and troublesome for me. And then these verses, which were neither supernaturally inspired nor learned before in the past, occurred to me. I've struggled hard to realise this, enough with trying to explain it. This teaching is not easily understood by those mired in greed and hate. Those caught up in greed can't see what's subtle, going against the stream, deep, hard to see and very fine, for they're shrouded in a mass of darkness. So as I reflected like this, my mind inclined to remain passive, not to teaching the Dhamma. Then Brahma Sahampati, knowing what I was thinking, thought, Oh my goodness, the world will be lost, the world will perish. For the mind of the realised one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha, inclines to remaining passive, not to teaching the Dhamma. Then, as easily as a strong person would extend or contract their arm, he vanished from the Brahma realm, and reappeared in front of the Buddha. He arranged his robe over one shoulder, knelt on his right knee, raised his joined palms towards the Buddha, and said, Sir, let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. Let the Holy One teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes. They're in decline because they haven't heard the teaching. There will be those who understand the teaching, that's what the Brahma Sahampati said. Then he went on to say, 
Among the Magadans there appeared in the past an impure teaching thought up by those still stained. Fling open the door to the deathless. Let them hear the teaching the stainless one discovered. Standing high on a rocky mountain, you can see the people all around. In just the same way, all-seer, wise one, ascend the palace built of Dhamma. You're free of sorrow, but look at these people, overwhelmed with sorrow, oppressed by rebirth and old age. Rise, hero, victor in battle, leader of the caravan. Wander the world without obligation. Let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. There will be those who understand. Then, understanding Brahma's invitation, I surveyed the world with the eye of a Buddha because of my compassion for sentient beings. And I saw sentient beings with little dust in their eyes and some with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties and with weak faculties, with good qualities and with bad qualities, easy to teach and hard to teach. And some of them lived seeing the danger in the floor to do with the next world, while others did not. It's like a pool with blue water lilies, or pink or white lotuses. Some of them sprout and grow in the water without rising above it, thriving under water. Some of them sprout and grow in the water, reaching the water's surface. And some of them sprout and grow in the water but rise up above the water and stand with no water clinging to them. In the same way, I saw sentient beings with little dust in their eyes, and some with much dust in their eyes. Then I replied in verse to Brahma Sahampati, Flung open are the doors to the deathless. Let those with ears to hear decide their faith. Thinking it would be troublesome, Brahma, I did not teach the sophisticated, sublime Dhamma among humans. Then Brahma Sahampati, knowing that his request for me to teach the Dhamma had been granted, bowed and respectfully circled me, keeping me on his right before vanishing right there. Then I thought, who should I teach first of all? Who will quickly understand this teaching? Then it occurred to me, that Alara Kalama is astute, competent, clever, and has long had little dust in his eyes. Why don't I teach him first of all? He'll quickly understand the teaching. But a deity came to me and said, Sir, Alara Kalama passed away seven days ago. And knowledge and vision arose in me. Alara Kalama passed away seven days ago. I thought... This is a great loss for Alara Kalama. If he had heard the teaching, he would have understood it quickly. Then I thought, who should I teach first of all? Who will quickly understand this teaching? Then it occurred to me, that Udika, Rama's son, is astute, competent, clever, and has long had little dust in his eyes. Why don't I teach him first of all? He'll quickly understand the teaching. But a deity came to me and said, Sir, Udika, Rama's son, passed away just last night. And knowledge and vision arose in me, Udika, Rama's son, passed away just last night. I thought, this is a great loss for Udika. If he had heard the teaching, he would have understood it quickly. Then I thought, who should I teach first of all? Who will quickly understand this teaching? Then it occurred to me, the group of five mendicants were very helpful to me. They looked after me during my time of resolute striving. Why don't I teach them first of all? Then I thought, where are the group of five mendicants staying these days? With clairvoyance that is purified and superhuman, I saw that the group of five mendicants were staying near Benares in the deer park at Isipatana. So when I had stayed in Uruvelar as long as I wished, I set out for Benares. While I was travelling along the road between Gaya and Bodgaya, the Arjivaka ascetic Upaka saw me and said, Reverend, your faculties are so very clear. 
and your complexion is pure and bright. In whose name have you gone forth, reverend? Who is your teacher? Whose teaching do you believe in? I replied to Upika in verse, I am the champion, the knower of all. Unsullied in the midst of all things, I've given up all, freed through the ending of craving. When I know for myself, who should I follow? I have no teacher. There is no one like me in the world with its gods. I have no counterpart. For in this world I am the perfected one. I am the supreme teacher. I alone am fully awakened, cooled, extinguished. I am going to the city of Kazi to roll forth the wheel of Dhamma. In this world that is so blind, I'll beat the deathless drum. According to what you claim, Reverend, you ought to be the infinite victor. The victors are those who, like me, have reached the ending of defilements. I have conquered bad qualities, Upaka. That's why I am a victor. When I had spoken, Upaka said, If you say so, Reverend, wobbling his head, he took a wrong turn and left. Travelling stage by stage, I arrived at Benares and went to see the group of five mendicants in the deer park at Issy Patana. The group of five mendicants saw me coming off in the distance and stopped each other, saying, Here comes the ascetic Gotama. He's so indulgent, he strayed from the struggle and returned to indulgence. We shouldn't bow to him or rise for him or receive his bowl and robe. But we can set out a seat. He can sit if he likes. Yet as I drew closer, the group of five mendicants were unable to stop themselves as they had agreed. Some came out to greet me and receive my bowl and robe. Some spread out a seat, while others set out water for washing my feet. But they still addressed me by name and as reverend. So I said to them, Mendicants don't address me by name and as reverend. The realised one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha. Listen, mendicants, I have achieved the deathless. I shall instruct you, I will teach you the Dhamma. By practising as instructed, you will soon realise the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. You will live, having achieved with your own insight, the goal for which people from good families rightly go forth from the lay life to homelessness. But they said to me, Reverend Gotama, even by that conduct, that practice, that gruelling work, you did not achieve any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. How could you have achieved such a state now that you've become indulgent, strayed from the struggle and returned to indulgence? So I said to them, The realised one has not become indulgent, strayed from the struggle and returned to indulgence. The realised one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha. Listen, mendicants, I have achieved the deathless. I shall instruct you, I will teach you the Dhamma. By practising as instructed, you will soon realise the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. But for a second time they said to me, Reverend Gotama, you've returned to indulgence. So for a second time I said to them, the realised one has not become indulgent. But for a third time they said to me, Reverend Gotama, even by that conduct, that practice, that gruelling work you did not achieve any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. How could you have achieved such a state now that you've become indulgent, strayed from the struggle and returned to indulgence? So I said to them, Mendicants, have you ever known me to speak like this before? No, we have not, sir. The realised one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha. Listen, mendicants, I have achieved the deathless. I shall instruct you. I will teach you the Dhamma. By practising as instructed, you will soon realise the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. You will live 
having achieved with your own insight the goal for which people from good families rightly go forth from the lay life to homelessness. I was able to persuade the group of five mendicants. Then sometimes I advised two mendicants while the other three went for alms. Then those three would feed all six of us with what they brought back. Sometimes I advised three mendicants while the other two went for alms. Then those two would feed all six of us with what they brought back. As the group of five mendicants were being advised and instructed by me like this, being themselves liable to be reborn, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn, they sought the unborn supreme sanctuary, extinguishment, and they found it. Being themselves liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted, understanding the drawbacks in these things, they sought the unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted supreme sanctuary, extinguishment. And they found it. Knowledge and freedom arose in them. Our freedom is unshakable. This is our last rebirth. Now there are no more future lives. Mendicants, there are these five kinds of sensual stimulation. What five? Sights known by the eye that are likeable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual and arousing. Sounds known by the ear that are likeable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual and arousing. Smells known by the nose that are likeable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual and arousing. Tastes known by the tongue that are likeable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. Touches known by the body that are likeable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. These are the five kinds of sensual stimulation. There are ascetics and Brahmins who enjoy these five kinds of sensual stimulation, tied, stupefied, attached, blind to the drawbacks, and not understanding the escape. You should understand that they have met with calamity and disaster, and are vulnerable to the wicked one. Suppose a deer in the wilderness was lying caught on a pile of snares. You'd know that it has met with calamity and disaster, and is vulnerable to the hunter. And when the hunter comes, it cannot flee where it wants. In the same way, there are ascetics and Brahmins who enjoy these five kinds of sensual stimulation, tied, stupefied, attached, blind to the drawbacks, and not understanding the escape. You should understand that they have met with calamity and disaster, and are vulnerable to the wicked one. There are ascetics and Brahmins who enjoy these five kinds of sensual stimulation without being tied, stupefied, or attached, seeing the drawbacks, and understanding the escape. You should understand that they haven't met with calamity and disaster, and are not vulnerable to the wicked one. Suppose a deer in the wilderness was lying on a pile of snares without being caught. You'd know that it hasn't met with calamity and disaster, and isn't vulnerable to the hunter. And when the hunter comes, it can flee where it wants. In the same way, there are ascetics and Brahmins who enjoy these five kinds of sensual stimulation without being tied, stupefied or attached, seeing the drawbacks and understanding the escape. You should understand that they haven't met with calamity and disaster and are not vulnerable to the wicked one. Suppose there was a wild deer wandering in the forest that walked, stood, sat and lay down in confidence. Why is that? because it's out of the hunter's range. In the same way, a mendicant, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion, while placing the mind and keeping it connected. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, as the placing of the mind and keeping it connected are stilled, a mendicant enters and remains in the second absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of immersion. 
with internal clarity and confidence and unified mind without placing the mind and keeping it connected. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, with a fading away of rapture, a mendicant enters and remains in the third absorption, where they meditate with equanimity, mindful and aware, personally experiencing the bliss of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful one meditates in bliss. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, giving up pleasure and pain, and ending former happiness and sadness, a mendicant enters and remains in the fourth absorption, without pleasure or pain, with pure equanimity and mindfulness. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, a mendicant going totally beyond perceptions of form, with the ending of perceptions of impingement, not focusing on perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, enters and remains in the dimension of infinite space. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, a mendicant going totally beyond the dimension of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, enters and remains in the dimension of infinite consciousness. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, a mendicant going totally beyond the dimension of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing at all, enters and remains in the dimension of nothingness. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, a mendicant going totally beyond the dimension of nothingness enters and remains in the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. Furthermore, a mendicant going totally beyond the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception enters and remains in the cessation of perception and feeling. And having seen with wisdom, their defilements come to an end. This is called a mendicant who has blinded Mara, put out his eyes without a trace, and gone where the wicked one cannot see. They've crossed over clinging to the world, and they walk, stand, sit, and lie down in confidence. Why is that? Because they're out of the wicked one's range. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha said.